Welcome back. This is another part in the series on the central control of reproduction and this one's going to be all about energy balance. Energy balance particularly as it relates to the control of reproduction as you go through puberty and in the adult. The role of nutrition in the world is huge. Undernutrition, overnutrition. This is a review taken from December uh, 2019 in Lancet. While more than 149 million children have stunted growth, childhood overweight and obesity are increasing almost everywhere. And suboptimal diets are responsible for one in five adult deaths globally. A huge global problem. And it's a growing problem. The world's population is increasing, but as it increases, so also the disparity between the rich and the poor. Here are obesity rates up to about 2012 and then extrapolated onwards. And we can see that the rates are going up and up and up and there's no sign of this increase stopping. And at the other end of the scale, and no pun was intended, um, it's not a funny matter, uh, the percentage of children under five who are stunted. 33% Western Central Africa, 34% Eastern and Southern Africa, 35% South Asia. Undernutrition contributes to nearly half of all deaths in children under five. Reproduction is very closely associated with energy balance. Why? Because reproduction is so energetically costly. If we just take species like birds and mammals, then they show a variety of costly behaviours even before they get started. Here we are, territorial behaviour, courtship behaviour, mating. Then you've got gamete production itself. Then you've got either incubation or uh, pregnancy in birds and mammals respectively. Then in mammals you have lactation, which is heavily energy demanding. Here we are. This is food consumption in a mouse as it goes through its pregnancy and then lactation. And as soon as it hits lactation, when it's got to feed the young, food intake goes up remarkably. And the energy costs of just general parental care, very energe energetically costly. So it's not surprising that energy balance and reproduction are closely associated physiologically. Potentially, this is a huge subject. It ranges from the way that energy balance and nutrition affects the gametes, fetal growth, early life programming of the fetus, childhood growth, puberty, adult maintenance and adult reproduction and effects on to the next generations and next generation again. We're going to be concentrating really here in the adult or in the uh, period between childhood and the adult, including puberty. So we're going to be concentrating on this bit, the way that reproduction is actually turned on here and is linked with energy balance and how it's maintained in the adult and linked in with energy balance. There are many examples of how energy balance links in with reproduction in humans. It's particularly obvious in women and girls, uh, a delay in puberty in children if they have a low, very low weight or have restricted food or eating disorders or if they engage in high levels of activity. The same kind of things can cause disruptions of the menstrual cycle in adults. Uh, lactation, heavily energy demanding and ovulation tends to be suppressed during lactation. So many things and things like this, PCO, polycystic ovarian syndrome, 50% of women with PCO are either overweight or clinically obese and they tend to have insulin resistance. So a metabolic disorder associated with a reproductive disorder. And the two sexes have different amounts of fat and different metabolism. Here we look at the fat mass typically in males and in females as they age. So this is in childhood here and in childhood both sexes lose fat mass initially but then as they reach puberty then what tends to happen is that in females they diverge and acquire a greater relative fat mass. 
and changes in fat mass and distribution also occur at the menopause. At the menopause, the high levels of estrogens typical of premenopausal women and normally functioning ovaries. As follicular function ceases at the menopause, the estrogen levels drop, and associated with that, there is a change in the fat distribution of fat mass. And the subcutaneous fat tends to really redistribute to the more visceral areas. It occurs in both sexes. Testosterone therapy in men with testosterone deficiency, men with testosterone deficiency tend to have a much greater fat mass, but if you treat them with testosterone, then there's weight loss. The complex association between steroid levels and metabolic disorders is well illustrated by this slide, where we're looking at serum testosterone levels in women. Here we have healthy women here, low levels of testosterone, healthy male levels are up here somewhere. And as soon as you start getting obese women, because obese women can change testosterone levels, uh, adrenal hyperplasia can change testosterone levels, polycystic ovarian syndrome can change uh, testosterone levels, raised testosterone levels are seen in severe insulin resistance in women. And transgender women, transgendering from female to male, with raised testosterone levels, the metabolic risk goes up. As soon as you raise testosterone levels, metabolic risk goes up. So there's a very close association between, between the sex steroids and metabolism. It's important to remember that this is all a two-way process. Not only does reproductive status affect metabolism and fat distribution, but also metabolism and fat distribution affects reproductive status. There are many pathways for this, but one important one is simply that adipose tissue can metabolize steroids. Androgens, for example, can be changed to estrogens via fat tissue. So things like testosterone, adipose tissue contains aromatase, aromatase changes androgens into estrogens. So where are the sites of interaction between steroids and metabolism? There are many. This is a very complex slide, which you really don't have to try and remember. Sites of action, effects of estrogens, effects of androgens. Here are the sites of action, just some examples. The hypothalamus, which we'll come on to later. Adipose tissue, the pancreas, the liver, muscle, the immune system. Effect of estrogens, many. Effect of androgens, many. Multiple sites of action of both steroids. We're going to try and understand how the system works and partly what some of the signals might be. But you have to remember, it is a very much a two-way process. Energy balance affects reproductive status and reproductive status affects energy balance. Here's a good example of this interaction. We're looking here against mass of a mouse along this axis against days long here. This is a control mouse and we're looking at its food intake up here and its weight gain over, over a period of time. We're going to change its reproductive status now. This is a female mouse, we're going to take out its ovaries. Look what happens. Take out the ovaries, weight gain goes up immediately, and so does food intake. And that weight gain is due to two things, increase in the amount of white tissue, white fat tissue, and a decrease in energy expenditure. So we've changed its energy balance just by taking out the ovaries. What's the signal? Well, we can reverse all these changes by giving back estradiol. So if we give back estradiol, it goes back to the normal situation. Where's that estradiol acting? At least part of it is working up in the brain and working on the control of appetite, putting up food intake. The increased food intake is then responsible for the increase in weight gain. For the rest of this lecture, we're going to be looking at how energy status and steroids really interact with each other in controlling this whole system. So here we've got our GnRH pulse generator driving the pituitary and then the whole of the reproductive system via the ovaries and testes with energy status somehow interacting. 
And in terms of developing your understanding, the output of puberty, a major reproductive event where the whole of the reproductive system is turned on, has played a key part in developing our current understanding. How can we explain things like this? This is looking at the age of menarche, and menarche is the first menstrual period. It's an indicator of when puberty occurs in girls, and the advantage of it, it's a single event, and it's often recorded, so there's good data on it. And we're looking at the age of menarche in various countries, mainly European countries in this instance, uh, and includes the USA, uh, over the last 150 years or so. And we can see that the age of menarche has been steadily declining wherever we look. Why should that be the case? Well, it's been put down to many things, but the answer generally these days is better socio-economic conditions, especially better nutrition. The link between age of menarche and socio-economic conditions has been studied many times in many different situations. Here's the data from India in 1998, where a study was done between well-off and underprivileged uh, girls, well-off with good nutrition, underprivileged, with much poorer living conditions and poorer nutrition. The girls who were well-off reached puberty much earlier than those who were underprivileged. But even under good socio-economic conditions, lifestyle effects are obvious. Here we have some data on the age of menarche in ballet dancers. Ballet dancers, because they're very athletic, often control their food intake, a lot of energy usage, compared to, let's say, more sedentary musicians and a control population. And we can see that the girls who are using a lot of energy reach menarche later than the musicians or the controls. Well, why should this be the case? Well, many years ago now, Rose Frisch in the 1970s was trying to understand what controlled the age of menarche in girls. And she was looking at their bodily condition, essentially. Here we look at a range of girls who were reaching menarche at the age of 11, and they had a height of about 155 centimetres. At the age of 12, they're a bit bigger, 13 bigger again, 14 bigger again. This doesn't say very much other than girls grow with age. But if we looked at the weight, or if she looked at the weight, but looking at the same girls and the weight rather than the height of the same girls, then there seemed to be a much more constant relationship between age at menarche and the weight that they reached menarche. So it looked as though whatever age they were, if they achieved a weight of 47, 48 kilos or so, they might go through puberty. They'd reach menarche. So height wasn't important, weight was. And Rose Frisch um, put forward the hypothesis that there was a critical body weight of 47 or 8, 48 kilos on average that was needed to be achieved before a girl would go through puberty. Now, she came in for a lot of criticism and nobody could quite understand this because how could the body sense what weight it was? But she refined her ideas and said, well, it actually wasn't body weight itself. She actually said it's a critical percent of body fat they had to achieve. If they achieve something like 17 percent of body fat, then they might go through uh, menarche. The fat content must be at least 22 percent for the maintenance of regular cycles. But again, while the data fitted, people criticised the concept because nobody could understand how body fat could have an input in the control of puberty. There was no way of the body at the time could, be, uh, could sense how much body fat. There was no theory for this. But the idea was plausible from a biological point of view. In view of the energetic costs of reproduction, females don't want to become pregnant unless they've got the energy stores to see them not only through the pregnancy, but also through the lactation which follows. So you need a lot of energy storage before you get pregnant if you're a mammal. And this would therefore dictate when you perhaps you went through uh, puberty. Let's switch our attention now to adults and look at energy use and energy expenditure in adults and how that affects the reproductive system. And we'll look at exercise. Here's a well-known example menstrual disorders and exercise. It's well known that women who exercise a lot, exert a lot of energy, 
have a high incidence of amenorrhea. Amenorrhea is a lack of menstrual cycles. So here we have women who are runners and as their training mileage increases, so the percentage of them who show amenorrhea goes up. But even when you're doing a lot of miles, then it's only 50% of women. But that's the general population. If you take elite squads, people training for the Olympics, for instance, menstrual disturbances may well be up to 100% of the whole population. Now, what's the reason for that? Well, if you just look at what's driving their ovaries, here the control women who may just do a small amount of exercise, lots of these are LH pulses against time along here. Lots of LH pulses. If you look at the women who are showing menstrual irregularities, then the LH pulsatility is suppressed. So here are the runners with amenorrhea, and we can see that the LH levels are far less pulsatile than in the normal controls, which are showing normal menstrual cycles. But it would be easy to argue that this response of increasing amenorrhea with exercise is not representative of the general population. It may be just that these is a self-selected population of athletes. Uh, often there's a change in diets, particularly a higher percentage of vegetarians, altered calorie intake, stricter diets. Are they actually representative of the normal population? Well, let's test it. Let's take some untrained women and subject them to an exercise regime. Here we are, three months of training, leading up to 10 miles a day for five days a week. So 50 days a week. So we're here somewhere. And 50% or so show disturbances in menstrual cycles. So this is a general response. Heavy exercise will disrupt menstrual function. And then we can ask the question, does it matter what type of exercise you do? Here we've just seen that running and it's also the case for other weight bearing sports, which are often associated with uh, a lot of muscle and less fat. There's a high incidence of menstrual irregularities with a lot of energy output. But with cycling and swimming, which are non weight bearing and emphasize strength rather than leanness, there's a low incidence of menstrual irregularities, even though the women may be using up the same amounts of energy. So that raises a question. Is body composition the key issue rather than energy balance? But changes in body composition alone can't explain everything. Here we're looking at uh, the effects of feeding and fasting on LH secretion in rhesus monkeys. So we've got time of day along here and we've got LH levels up here. And this is a rhesus monkey under normal feeding conditions. Now then. The next day, the animal is fasted and we can see almost immediately LH pulses are down. Certainly within four hours, they're down before any changes in body composition could possibly have occurred. And you refeeding, LH levels go up again. So the response is independent of changes of body weight or body composition. But it is obvious that energy availability is important, even in normal adults who aren't heavily exercising. Here we have looking at LH pulses over a 24 hour profile, 24 hour period, LH pulses in somebody with high energy intake. As we reduce the energy intake, the pattern of those LH pulses changes. Down here, which is very limited energy intake, much bigger pulses, but not much less frequent. So LH pulsatility is disturbed with changes in energy intake. So we're beginning to see there's quite a complex relationship between energy balance, how much fat you've got and reproductive status. And it's a two way process, energy balance affecting reproductive status and reproductive status and steroids affecting appetite and energy balance. So what are the signals involved? We know that sex steroids are part of this axis, but what about this one? How do you know, how does the body know how much energy you've got, how much fat you've got? Many potential signals obviously exist. You have the uh, primary hormones, metabolic hormones in the blood and the metabolites which control them, things like glucose. You've got hormones coming from the gut and you've got hormones coming from the fat. 
For many years, none of these were understood at all, but our understanding has advanced tremendously over the last 20 years or so. Primary ones in terms of metabolic things, insulin, glucose, free fatty acids, then you've got gut hormones like ghrelin, CCK, PYY, and fat-derived hormones, leptin and adiponectin. And we're just going to concentrate on one, leptin, because leptin was one of the first ones to be identified as a potential signal coming from fat and having an input onto the hypothalamic control of the reproductive system. Leptin was first discovered by looking at a mouse mutant. Here we are, a very, very fat mouse, and it had a recessive gene. And it was called the ob, ob mouse for obese, obese. And this very fat mouse turned out that the ob gene should produce a hormone called leptin. And the ob, -ob mouse, this recessive uh, defect, was leptin deficient. That caused them to be very fat, but they also were infertile. When leptin was discovered, then by giving leptin back to these leptin deficient mice, there was a reduction in food intake, they lost weight, and their fertility was restored. At the time, finding a hormone which was related to the amount of fat you had was very exciting. And we now know it works something like this. Here we have our fat tissue and leptin is secreted by white, but not brown, fat tissue. And the more, uh, more fat tissue you have, the more leptin you produce. One of leptin's site of action is up on the hypothalamus, where it helps regulate food intake and energy expenditure. So if you get thin, for instance, if you lose fat, less leptin is produced, less leptin, there's less feedback onto the hypothalamus, and that puts up your appetite and changes your metabolism. So you've increased your appetite, reduced your energy expenditure, and you put weight back on. So this was a nice feedback cycle, whereby fat tissue, by producing a hormone, could help regulate appetite and energy expenditure. Now, given this system, Let's ask this question. What would you expect to happen if you were leptin deficient? So here we have the normal system, fat tissue producing leptin, feeding back onto the hypothalamus to control food intake and increase energy expenditure. If we get rid of leptin, there it is, leptin's gone. This feedback disappears, so it no longer depresses food intake, it puts up food intake and it no longer increases energy expenditure and energy expenditure is decreased. And the combination of those two increases the amount of fat you have. So in answer to this question, what would you expect to happen if you were leptin deficient? You'd expect to have a lot of fat. And that's just what the obob mice had. And you'd expect to see exactly the same thing if rather than if you can't produce leptin, if you can still produce leptin, but were then unable to respond to it because of a deficit in the leptin receptors, in that situation, if you can't see the leptin, then again, you'd have increased food intake, decreased energy expenditure, increased fat. It would be as though you were leptin deficient because you can't see the leptin. And that's exactly what you find. Here are three patients with leptin deficiency. This is a patient, that's a patient, that's a patient, these are two healthcare workers, 27 years, BMI of 51, 35 years, BMI of 46, 40 years old, BMI of 55, very obese. What's wrong with them? These two girls have, are infertile uh, and don't go through normal cycles, and this man has got very low testosterone and is in fact hypogonadal. It's almost as though he hasn't gone through puberty. If you treat them with leptin, what happens? Well, let's look at the weight. This is a time in months. Treat them with leptin. This is their weight up here in terms of kilos and they all rapidly lose weight with continued leptin treatment. And look at them, 
This, he is the same as that. He's lost enormous amounts of weight. These two, enormous amount of weight loss. And not only that, they resume fertility. These two start going through regular ovulatory cycles and he shows all the signs of having gone through puberty, pubic and axillary hair growth, growth of his testes and penis and increased muscle mass. So where was the leptin acting? Well, it would be nice if it was acting on LH pulsatility, acting on the hypothalamus to drive the GnRH pulse generator. And that was what initial observation certainly said it could do. Here we are, some fasted male monkeys. We've already seen that if you fast male monkeys, then their LH pulses go down. No sign of them. These are the animals treated with saline. Treat them with leptin and LH pulsatility resumes. These are two separate monkeys. The next question then, could leptin be used as a treatment for women who is infertility due to a hypothalamic issue, for instance, the GnRH pulse generator isn't being driven properly. So hypothalamic, amenorrhea, lack of cycles. Percentage of women showing cycles, if you treat them just with a placebo over a course of weeks, then nothing much happens. Give them leptin and sure enough, fertility, percentage showing cycles, leaps up rapidly. So leptin can act as a drive of the hypothalamus. Well, where's a leptin acting? Well, we know the system works something like this. We have the kisspeptin neurons feeding into the GnRH neurons, driving GnRH, driving the ovaries and testes. Where's leptin acting? The GnRH neurons themselves don't express the leptin receptor, so it can't be acting on them. But certainly a population of the kisspeptin neurons express, express the leptin receptor. Not all of them, but some. So it would be a working model that leptin is working on these kisspeptin neurons, which then are driving the GnRH. That leaves one major question to be answered. How can metabolic signals or the metabolic hormone signals get to the control sites, the control sites for appetite, the control sites for reproduction, the control sites for temperature regulation? Well, our ideas now is that these circulating signals are in the blood, but we know that most of the blood vessels within the brain have got a blood-brain barrier and they should provide a barrier to the metabolic hormone signals getting into the brain. But in the median eminence, the vessels are fenestrated. They have holes in them. That allows the releasing factors, uh, releasing hormones, controlling the antipituitary to get into them, but it also means that blood-borne molecules such as the metabolic hormones can get out. Now then, lining the third ventricle are a layer of epithelial cells called ependymal cells. They have long processes, and the ones down here at the bottom of the third ventricle have long processes which extend through the median eminence towards these fenestrated, fenestrated vessels. They essentially, their long processes are bathed in things like leptin, glucose, ghrelin, and they can act as a transport process to get them into the third ventricle, and then other tannocytes can transport them towards the various neuronal sites which are controlling appetite or temperature regulation or things like the kisspeptin neurons. So we have a transport system which is available monitoring things in the blood and allowing access of the controlling neurons to those things. So let's put the whole thing together now. We started off looking at the brain as a black box and we're looking at reproductive output and we've seen all kinds of things. It's got a GnRH pulse generator, there's negative feedback of steroids, there's a positive feedback system of steroids, there's sexual differentiation within the hypothalamus, there's daily signals coming in, the seasonal breeding, uh, seasonal si signals coming in, the stress, energy balance. But on top of that, it's all integrated together with metabolism, temperature regulation and appetite. Well, thanks very much for listening.